the snout. And once again, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to this uh, sort of meetup, this discussion. Um, so we're going to do something slightly different this time. Um, we kind of talked about maybe doing it in the past, but maybe having like show and tells or people talking about what's been happening. Mm. So we're very lucky today to have uh, Kate Treglone from University of Melbourne. Is that correct? Uh, yep. And Nancy as well. Um, who are going to present the belt framework. And this was part of the work that you did um, with the transition earlier in the year. Well, I'll, I'll let you explain that in, in a little bit, Kate. <laughs> As I say, the okay. idea here is that Kate's gonna just talk about their experience, what they did, what's been happening over the last few months. And then we'll maybe have more of a discussion about that because I think what we've found interesting in the past is we all know what we're talking about for a given value of no, but when we start to talk about it, I think things come out, more interesting mm -hmm. things come out in the conversation uh, and, and the knowledge here, if that makes sense. So I think I'll just hand it over to you, Kate. And Okay. Is that okay? Thank you. Yes, cool. wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. It's fantastic to be here. Um, hello to everybody. Um, so, I mean, we're very lucky because we were also um, invited by the very excellent um, uh, Design Distance Education blog um, to write a, a a summary of some of our work. And so this is really related to that. So in part, my plan is to just talk pretty generally about it um, as an introduction. And for those who haven't had a chance to read that blog post yet. So I'm going to try and share this screen. And I've just put a link to the blog post in the chat box, but feel free to listen to Kate first before you read the, the article again. <laughs> it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll just kind of point you in the right in the right direction for each of them. Um, so the, the blog post and the talk is called Belt Designs a Diagram. Um, and uh, so I'm going to skip through that in about five minutes or 10 minutes. And then I'm looking forward to a conversation after that. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, the first thing to say is um, that it, um, this BELT and the DIA stand for Delivery Interaction and Assessment are kind of coming from two different directions. This provided us with some guidance when all of a sudden the world moved online. It was the middle of March. I think we all remember it. I saw some photographs of colleagues with large monitors kind of exiting the building um, and a whole lot of students suddenly looking through small windows on our screens. Um, we needed a framework that could help us to understand this experience and also to work with subject coordinators and others who we support in our faculty. I'm going to talk about that in a second. There are two links which are um, here. One, uh, the right-hand one, relates to the blog post that um, Derek's just mentioned, and he's already shared that link. Um, the left-hand one is a link to these resources which are in our uh, website, and you're welcome to have a rummage around in there. I'm going to talk about those today. Um, the key thing to notice is this little orange blob right in the middle of that diagram. It focuses on learning engagement and belonging. And I'm gonna come back to that because that's in the middle because it's the most important thing. And that's what we're really aiming for. This is us, BELT, Built Environments, Learning and Teaching. We're an academic group um, and we work in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. That's all of us, some of us more immediately, others more distributed having a party. Um, and uh, we are really describing, I guess, a number of different modes that we operate in. Um, we are creative problem solvers. We're designers, most of us, but from different um, backgrounds. So we have people from architecture. We have people from communications. We have people from engineering. Um, we come from a whole range of different design stripes. Um, we also are researchers. We're an academic group, as I mentioned. And we're also kind of focused on consultancy, not in a formal way, but working with the academics within our faculty to support what they do. So as such, we are designers, we're researchers, and we're consultants. That's what we, how we describe our activities, if not our titles. Um, so designing is what we do. And so who we are is built. Designing is what we do. This is our building. Um, uh, and uh, this is the place where our Bachelor of Design is held. And it's also a place where a number of postgraduate 
um, degrees are delivered, including landscape architecture, architecture, urban planning, urban design, um, property construction management, all about space and making, basically. But as designers who come usually from that place and are now just connected virtually to it, we design stuff. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see a bit of a timeline of how we designed this diagram. The move online, that was the beginning of 2020. Remember when we thought life was going to be kind of semi-normal and we all had ambitions for the year? Um, quite soon after that, kind of those, those uh, you know, exciting thoughts, there was the move online and all of a sudden, we had to come up with some kind of a framework for conversation. So we came up with version one of the DIA. We developed a website very quickly. Um, and we also looked at what sites were out there. Um, our academics within our faculty also had to contend with a sudden move to Canvas, which is our learning management system. But it was a wholesale move of the whole institution from the beginning of this year, just to turn it up to 11. So we did that as well. Um, we developed a number of guides and we supported academics through, through some sweeps. Um, I'm not going to go into that in, in detail, but happy to talk about that later. Um, the diagram was developed around the middle of the year. And then we've been applying and sharing that through so-called belt sessions, which are um, uh, sessions that we hold with uh, staff. And um, we're up to the second lot of fab sweeps. We're about here now, looking forward to the next bit. The diagram itself relates delivery, interaction and assessment. You're going to see some on the slides and I'm happy to share them afterwards. The grey quotes come from the blog, so you can the blog post, so you can find it all there. The important thing about this was to open conversations with subject coordinators, which were about thinking of delivery, interaction and assessment as interrelated and focused on learning, engagement and belonging, as I said. The first question in that kind of instant was, how do I move my stuff online? How am I going to deliver it to students? And that was the kind of immediate concern. So to open a space so that we could have richer conversations was really important. And this was a mechanism that we used. It was also really important to think about a different expectation for student activity across the week, not that they were going to sit in a single place and both receive wisdom, but also participate even semi-consciously in a group experience was something that needed to be consciously considered. So in our developed diagram, these things are overlapping. You can see them kind of disaggregated here, and that describes it a little bit more fully. Delivery refers to learning objects um, that teachers share, video, readings, references, studio project briefs, subject information or instructions. So kind of, you know, one way. Interaction was a description of two-way relationships, student to student, student to staff. But the importance of co-constructed learning or ideas, if we want to think about it that way, but also the way that um, interrelation within learning, especially in design, is an important part of what we do and how we understand. Assessment is the third part there, a really tricky thing, again, in design, of course, because we get all the fun bits. Um, but it's something that um, was impacted and is impacted everywhere by institutional requirements as well. So assessment obviously needs to sit in various different ways, but also think about how it aligns with other activities and to take multiple paths, which is why it's got several arrows sitting there. Um, again, just returning to this idea of learning engagement and belonging as our North Stars. These are the things that we really need to keep focus on and keep all of our focus on because we know that learning engagement is this prerequisite um, for academic achievement. How, how committed, how engaged, how motivated students are intellectually, emotionally, culturally, in terms of their ambition is really, really key um, and particularly in terms of motivation, I would argue, for a design set of learning and belonging as part of a larger group and a larger cohort, developing belonging. We were talking about enculturation in a way uh, beforehand. Um, so I've talked about BELT, I've talked about designing, I've talked about the DIA and the GRAM in diagram. I've talked about this relational framework. It's also really important to say that we were doing this for teaching online. 
whole lot of these ideas are really translatable for face-to-face -face learning, but we needed to think about them in terms of teaching online because that was the challenge we were presented with. Um, the intersection of all of these things uh, and the relationship between all of these things is really important. And so we incorporated within our diagram a representation of that as being organised or in some ways being taking a coordinated approach. It's really being a designer in the way that these three different elements come together with this kind of central paired aim. So organised is really about this kind of ultimate objective um, and understanding the, um, the enablers for that. You can see on the right hand side, um, teaching online resources, which was part of a set of um, guides and uh, supports we provided to sessional staff who started with us at the beginning of this semester. Also at the bottom, a quote from um, Jones 2020 that I think might have come via Heritarchus as well. So we've got everybody in the room, that's very exciting, but a really fantastic thing to keep front of mind that this designing is not of a product, it's not a website, that's not the important thing. It's actually about how it engages students in their learning. Um, and then this kind of nearly last thing is really to think about teaching online as these kinds of sets of windows. And I look at everybody right now through this particular format. And I see, we see students on the right hand side, de-identified, but this kind of set of windows into their lives. On the left hand side at the bottom, we can see how our group has been developing um, some particular approaches to virtual site visits. How can we make use of existing or um, particular uh, resources, um, information, space, spatial information as a way to help students to explore space in a virtual way if they're not able to actually leave their homes, which is what's going on in Melbourne at the moment. Um, and at the top, there's a reminder that on our web page that we put together, we have a thing which is celebrating great moves online. So this was our way of crowdsourcing from the very beginning, great things that were happening across our faculty and celebrating those. There are all sorts of people who were making use of laptops on top of ironing boards and then something else. And uh, they were able to share these workarounds. And right in the very beginning, that was a really, really important set of ideas for us to draw on. So we're very grateful that as we've developed our diagram and our thinking, we've been able to draw on ideas from an international community from our local community and um, across emerging ideas as people have tested and refined those as well. So that's the kind of fly past of uh, the blog post. Um, I'm really looking forward to a conversation that starts from that place. Um, I had a few ideas and I think I'll probably, Derek, you can tell me what's the best thing to do here. I'm thinking there are actually, questions that can come, sorry? Yeah, maybe a few questions if, if, if that'd be okay yeah. with yourself. Um, yeah. Just give people the opportunity to ask a few questions of what you've been doing. Um, oh, okay. And, and then we can maybe- Can we can ask them questions? Yeah, absolutely, most definitely. So okay. we won't spend too long with the, the question or uh, grilling you on this, Kate, but I know that there's, I've, I've certainly got a few questions that would be um, in, interesting to ask, but I, I'm going to open it out to, if it's okay with yourself, I'll open it out to everybody else. Does anybody want to ask anything of Kate, but in particular what's, what Kate has just presented? So if not, then I might just quickly ask a, a kind of boring question, um, but the interaction that you mentioned, both the interaction and the assessment, could you talk mm. a bit more about the details of that, the kind of specifics? I mean, what sorts of opportunities for interaction do you give to students? Is it through forums, is it through social media, or is it a blend of all of these things? What's the sort of the bits and pieces, the mechanics of, of, of that, Kate? Let me show you a, um, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> cool. I'll show you a thing. <laughs> Honestly, this wasn't, wasn't prepared, this wasn't. <laughs> I'll show you this one, um, which is, this is within our site. Uh, we have, and I see Pippa is in the room, who was really um, a central character in developing a lot of this content. In each of our sections, um, we have a kind of a description of what's going on. 
and then we have some examples. Um, in this case, our discussion about interaction online included these things. So a panel discussion, a group discussion, student presentations or a design review, um, desk crits and collaborative feedback, um, working on a collaborative project or a design charrette or an intergroup session. Um, in these, within each of these, this is, I'll look at this one instead, um, a learning, there are, we identify the learning aims to kind of unpack how interaction is um, central to that. We talk about tactics and tool options. Um, and then we also pair that up with delivery because our, I guess our thinking really developed around the idea that these things are paired. It's very rare that you're doing one thing without the other. The, the, it's kind of like a graphic equaliser. You might be focused down one end or up the other end, but they, they tend to travel together a little bit. Um, so that's the way that all of that has gone together, as well as in each case, some things to consider because not everything fits everywhere um, and some examples or references. So I don't, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. And again, just to stress, uh, these are also all of these resources. These are available. People can you know, have a look at it. I think we've got a link in the resources page on the distance education. But, yep. but if you wanted to repost um, a, a link to that, Kate, um, in the chat. Well, I'll pick it up after. I'll make sure there's a link um, to the video and stuff like that as well. But these are all freely available. Anybody can have a look at these, make use of them. Yep. It's a, yeah. I mean, it's a public site. Yeah. Um, please, please reference it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, any other questions from anyone? Please feel free to chip in. Unmute yourself and just have a chat. Oh, is that Left Terrace getting ready? I can see he, he's got his asking questions. Oh, yeah. so on. No, no, no. I mean, I mean no, it's, it's, um, it's fantastic that we're all here and uh, discussing this, uh, you know, pressing issues. But I'm Left Terrace uh, for everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm a designer and a lecturer um, for the past, uh, let's say, five years. I've been involved in uh, design education research, this relationship between students, lecturers, and uh, in the industry. Uh, I've posted on the chat the link for Design Education Forum, which is the second year of the forum uh, this year, where we are also the host of Design Education Talks podcast. Uh, Derek has been a fantastic guest. You can see his uh, episode there. If you just Google this education talk, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're all this, you know, all the podcasting platforms as well, Google Podcast app. Uh, so yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. And the pressing issues of, uh, of this uh, blended teaching we're doing, you know, and mm. the conversation about, you know, I mean, my, my perspective is from, mm, it's a bit student-centered, you know, it's like, because it seems that we're having a monologue in this. Oh, how do we adapt? How do we get, you know, all this? But mm. <clears throat> all these discussions that the students, the learning that's happening where the class finishes, all the, you know, how do we, <clears throat> because I think the students are doing a great job. The students are, are, are adapting and they're trying to engage. Uh, we've just destroyed their world for them. And they're, and mm. they're being, from my experience at least, uh, they're doing their best. <clears throat> so really, I think discussions need to also become more student-centered. And so how, how mm. can we help them more? Or how, yep. how can we support them more? Because in, in, a, in a way, we're more resilient than them. Remember? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's very true. And um, you're forecasting our current project, uh, which is very focused on kind of unpacking the middle of that a whole okay. lot further. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. This initial framework really did come while its focus at the center was on learning, learning mm -hmm. engagement and belonging, student experience. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I will always say is that teaching, teaching doesn't happen until learning is happening. You know, there's some kind of notion <laughs> that somehow you can teach and that that's this, this kind of event that can happen. But if no one's learning, actually no teaching is happening. Absolutely. And so I think it, that, you know, that's this kind of really important idea that sometimes gets lost in the static a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
at the same time, our, our institution um, is very much a traditional university. It's kind of the polar opposite, if you like, of um, open universities. It's, a, it's very much a kind of a sandstone institution and it's very place focused. Mm -hmm. So this was a very big shift and a very sudden shift. And uh, this, um, this, this framework, I guess, was a way to engage academics in that conversation. It's unfair of me to kind of characterise uh, what happens there as very um, conservative because, in fact, there's been great moves and great investment and exploration of online learning and technologies to support learning. So there are plenty of people around the place doing some really cool things. Mm. Um, but the institution as a whole remains very kind of campus focused. And so this was a mechanism for those conversations as much as anything. Now that we're there, um, it's fantastic to see people having a much richer conversation around um, engagement, um, uh, well-being, and support of students, the student experience and the student perspective. Absolutely. And to see students becoming a whole lot more kind of vocal in that as well. Um, we have a student forum that is kind of, you know, finding its stripes right now and um, really stepping into this conversation in a very vocal way. And that's, that's fantastic to see. So I wonder, just to put those two points together then, one of the questions mm. I was gonna pick up on, um, Kate, and it maybe touches on your point there on Left Terrace, it's how do you move from this position of almost like um, operational thinking or, um, so like you, the way you phrased it, Kate, was that how do you move it from a, how am I going to make this all go online? you shift that and you have a richer conversation about, well, again, I've found this too in the UK that some of the conversations we've had, as soon as you move that shift and you start to then articulate some of the things that have always been implicit in your thinking, particularly for those mm. student-centred or student-focused lecturers, then this mm. massive outpouring comes out and suddenly you realise, or other people realise for themselves how much they know about this. And it's almost mm. as if this excuse to articulate this stuff is perhaps mm. one of the nicest things that's happened if that makes yeah. any kind of sense yeah no I think I think it really does and and um I mean it was such a shocking event I think March of this year that you know the immediate problem was how do I translate and this this is a design problem you know how do I the the, the simple answer is I take what I do and I relocate it and so that's the kind of simple solution it clearly couldn't be the ultimate solution, but if you need to do it in 24 hours, that was the immediate kind of problem that people were trying to, assess, to, to address. But as the semester kind of progressed and we started to see what some members of our faculty and our colleagues around the world were doing, it started to make that design question and the challenge a whole lot more interesting. So that then the challenge starts to fit to, to start to move into how do I engage with students with these ideas online? How do I move the, um, make the content um, arrive for a student distant from me? If I'm not standing there and, and joining all the dots for people, how can they join the dots and how do I support them to do that independent of me? So that I think what I find really interesting as um, an educator and also as a designer is how that shift has happened over the last six months and how that I think has opened up a whole lot of new ways of engaging with these um, with these questions so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens over the next six months to be honest I think people are kind of you know it's not so much the new normal it's like new normal we, we, we can't really remember normal who knows what that was anymore it's gone um so we're, we're into the next the next normal. That's a good thing. Next normal, that's quite nice. Does anyone else have any other questions for Kate before we move on to um, sort of more of a wider discussion? Um, no? No. Okay, well, I, I was going to ask one, and maybe, maybe this hints at more of a discussion rather than anything else. There's a few times, Kate, that you've mentioned, or you've hinted at, um, the relationship between design and education and almost you acting and you were quite explicit about this and a few other people have been as well in previous conversations mm -hmm. that they have been acting as designers you know this is what we do as designers um i just wondered is, have you had any epiphanies about that relationship between 
either learning or education and design or did it just come mm. as part of a natural practice and it's still mulling in there? Is there any... Uh, well, you see, you said all my favourite words in a sentence, and this is a good thing. My PhD was around design epiphany. You probably secretly know that. I didn't. Um, no, I didn't. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I like the fun stuff. It's, um, but I think um, what I find interesting about all of this is to, to consider designing as a form of exploration and learning. So this is not a new thought. There are plenty of people who think about it in those terms. But I think when we really solidly place designing as a form of exploration and then we pair it with education, we can talk about um, supporting uh, people who are learning to design and we can support people who are designing learning or designing for learning is a better way to put it because I, I think we all know it's not quite that um, organized um, and um, and that um, designing can be a way of engaging and expanding new ideas um, there are a whole I mean learning design of course is what some I guess of that co the coordination triangle that sits across the top of the diagram can start to hint at how can we bring together, how can we enable these parts to lead to the kind of briefed outcome? And um, I'm, re I'm reminded, I guess, of the backwards design idea, Harris and McHarg, I think, um, who said, you know, way back in 1998, um, we can identify learning outcomes and then we can start to build towards that you know that's what curriculum should be um, now those ideas are very very accepted but the integration of design in there as a way of kind of deliberately using ideas and tools um, is a really interesting one i'm sure other people have comments on design and learning and how they intersect though prompt Definitely, yep. Don't, don't, don't. Anybody, anybody want to jump in there? Anybody, yep. anybody. I had some questions. Go for it, Kate. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, because I was kind of interested to think about um, what online, what people think online might mean for teaching and learning later. So, you know, as I said before, we've come a long way in six months. Um, and I think what, what work looks like, what home looks like, what learning looks like is pretty different. What work looks like, um, what, what might it look like in six months' time? What things, I guess, do you think are going to survive from our current experience and what is going to be something that someone half remembers in six months time and says, Oh, well, you know, back then we used to use zoom. Um, what, what do you reckon is going to stay? What's going to stick? Go on. Anybody? If you, nobody volunteers, I'm going to start naming some names. Huh? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Does anybody uh, from the, the rest of the team want to uh, chip in? And Nancy or Sarah, are you part of the? Yeah, go on. You've been, you've been on. pointed at now. Yeah. So I what does it look like after this? <laughs> um, I honestly think um, recorded lectures are going to be one of the big things that are going to stay, not for the sake of uh, replacing live lectures, but that archive of being able to access um, previous knowledge um almost like a library so i know that you know there's a whole lot of chatter about libraries getting outdated but i have a feeling there's going to be some sort of renaissance in terms of being able to access um uh you know um data and information um through a digital medium that's a mm. little bit more um academically sound than let's say wikipedia <laughs> That's really interesting. So you think, 
so like a kind of a um yeah a repository or a record do you think so, of it as a record or do you think it will be like a set of um like an archive or i don't think ah oh. I think it's also, I have a feeling probably in about five years time, it might be the stuff that we've recorded, particularly in this year is going to mark a period in, you know, just, just history, but in the long term, um, I think it might act more like a, like an archive. So things might get, things will definitely get outdated, but you know how we look at, you know, um, you know text from hundreds of years ago for base, um, theories i have uh i get a sneaky suspicion that some of the lecture recordings are going to play a bigger role than it's done mm. um mm. when we're face um post as i call it post covid yeah yeah i'd like to build on that idea oh mm. Yeah, in that um, I've had some fantastic conversations with subject coordinators about the kind of content they're delivering online using lectures and how some of that content, it's factual, it's not going to change. And then other parts of it as being case studies that they're wanting to use as examples of current issues in order to perhaps highlight how some of that factual stuff um, is changing over time. And one of the comments was that the online forum and the ability to record stuff, they're more motivated to actually be updating their kind of relevant case studies because instead of redoing the whole lecture, they're seeing themselves as being able to re-record a 12 minute um, video and to sort of mm -hmm. slot that into the place within, um, you know, perhaps a series of small videos that they might use to cover content. I actually hmm. think that's quite an interesting concept of sort of it's like swapping pieces in and pulling pieces out um, hmm. is one way. I think that's really interesting. And that makes me think a little bit about the role of that academic as more of a producer. You know, that's, that becomes another hat that um, an academic needs to, needs to wear. Does that sound right? Is that in line with what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think the way that they presented it to me was um, you can always redo a few slides in a PowerPoint presentation, but mm -hmm. um, this idea that it is is just this ability to just um, really focus in on just these really interesting kind of relevant case studies um, yeah. and not have yeah. to... You worry about the production of just that one thing rather than the production of the whole the whole mm. as long as it obviously fits in with you know the the general theme yeah yeah and the kind of overall structure of it all i think that's really fascinating so How interesting. Does it beg the question in any way if we have already had say for example in certain other subjects where we have quite a lot of static subject matter then why has the lecture proven so popular why have we not been doing this for decades already Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Um, well, that's a good question. Is it, who's driving it, do you think? Is it the audience or the lecturer? That's what you need to ask next, yes. <laughs> Just saying, you know? Because, yeah, I mean, that, what you're talking about in terms of the academic as producer, that's definitely the experience of the Open University, you know, way back in 1970. You've got to produce these materials. They're going to be broadcast on television. So you've got to think about well, what are the things that are not going to change? What are the things that are core? Uh, you know, how do you even describe these things? How do you set them out? And even then, it still looks out of date to the point where, you know, taking the piss out of open university lecturers became a cultural thing in the UK because of the terrible dress sense that academics have. Um, yeah. So yeah, the notion of the academic as a producer, that's something that definitely sits with our experience. Um, and mm. it, it shifts the way that you think about the content that you're delivering. Um, yep. And again, that gives us a massive challenge in design because it's not just about the content. It can never be just mm. about the content. It's how, how do you make sure that other side of it, as you say, Kate, the learning bit, which is a little bit, mm. of how do you make sure that that takes place? Um, yeah. And, yeah, and, so and really... Uh, sorry, really, I guess, because, um, you know, the kind of challenge of teaching design, of course, is that um, no matter if, if what you're doing is to develop kind of 
conceptual tools if really what designing is all about is each individual developing their own set of processes and preferences and uh, their own skill set because it's clearly quite an individual undertaking to deliver that from a central place with limited interaction to be able to coach each individual student becomes a really challenging thing um, for as long as we think that designers should be producing individual visions um, if we if we're going to um, if we decided that they could all just produce the same thing and that would be design, then there wouldn't be a problem. But um, we, we still think, and I still think, um, that it is the individual vision of possibility that's so exciting about design. But how does open universities manage that? Like, so how, we, do you, how do you do it? We don't take quite the same view of the individual um, as strictly as that, um, we've actually Okay. Got some interesting research from one of our first, one of our earliest um, sort of assessment uh, assessments. It's basically a very, very simple um, sort of methods based, design methods based approach to yep. stepping through a recipe to become a designer, or not to become a designer, to start your journey of experience uh, mm. to become a designer. And in doing that, what we find is that it's actually <clears throat> a blend between. The individual creativity negotiated within a community of creativity. So, for example, we get them to design a T-shirt. That already comes with a whole bunch of cultural baggage. You know what a T-shirt actually is, how you've learned the language of T-shirt, where you put stuff on T-shirts, where you put messages, mm. graphics, communication, meaning, all that kind of stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you're already bringing to that process. Mm. Um, but our students are also then engaged in a community of you know, hundreds of other students. So it's actually quite a large community. And that means that they can negotiate the individual creativity with the kind of social creativity. And we found that that mm. does tend to influence what the cohort reckons creativity is. Um, mm. So there is this kind of like negotiation between the individual and the kind of creative community. Um, and that's quite nice, but we don't know mm. whether or not that's scalable i mean we think it works around about say three four five hundred students just now we've got a cohort of a thousand students we don't know whether Ooh. that'll be too big for us um Maybe. well that's that's one of the ways that we would do that we would start with a very simple sort of activity based on methods based approach <clears throat> and then it comes to life with student interaction and student activity both individually and then negotiated with um, mm. a kind of community of practice and also the, the tuition spaces and the tuition opportunities that students have to to, to engage um yeah. so yeah, it's a kind of mix of those two things yeah and so as a student kind of progresses through their learning does that shift yes I mean, we, we similarly have a kind of a a me I guess a methods-based approach, yep. um, which is very kind of focused on the tools yep. that designers use, if you like, mm -hmm. um, on as, a, as an entry point into mm -hmm. the discussion. But yep. So how does that progress and how do you then manage those in an online space? That That's the tricky one because there's definitely a blurring of the boundary um, of knowledge because there's a point at which we don't know, to be quite honest with you. We don't know how far mm. we can take this. Um, so we teach non-specialist design. Um, design as a generic approach to lots of either problems or contexts. Um, and that means that we don't ever find out whether we, you know, we can almost ground it um, in a specific design discipline. I mean, we know we can um, mm. because you can do that explicitly but you're then so indoctrinated into a specific discipline and domain that it becomes harder to mm. tell whether or not that individual actualization of design as a metacognitive process actually kind of mm. takes place. We take a focus on the latter one. So yep. in truth, the jury is out on this one. I mean, we've looked at other curricula, like an architecture, particularly distance architecture courses. Um, mm. And usually we find almost exactly the same model. So for example, the um, Indira Gandhi University in India, their architectural uh, distance education model is, is almost exactly the same, that it's the individual learning content bit with the, the student's own individual practice and then their practice in a context. And those three things have to be expressed by the student. And that's the thing that brings it kind of out. What we don't know is what happens to those students that can't do that or that 
It's almost mm. like the, the cases of failure. Where that works, it works really well. Else is not um, and where it doesn't work, we, we're not entirely sure. Uh, it's right. a kind of honest answer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, challenging, challenging and interesting. No, definitely. That's and I think that's, that's where it's going to be really interesting. I mean, it'll be really interesting to hear what other people are doing as well um, mm. you know, in other places and, and in other subjects. Um, because I think that's what's going to be interesting out of this is the boundary limits or the boundary pushing that's going to happen, I think, in some courses and in some disciplines. And it'd be really interesting to hear if anybody else is um, doing sort of similar things or other things. Yeah, I can I, I can ask a question of Nancy just because she's there. And we were talking about virtual site visits before. And I know, you know, one of the things that has been really interesting um, has been to look at um, the use of different kinds of platforms for exploring sites virtually, not just for design. So obviously in um, architecture, landscape design, urban design, visiting sites as a kind of a site for activity or proposal is um, a kind of a foundational experience. But, you know, other disciplines use site in a very different way. And I think you've been involved in some of that work yeah. and some of those discussions. Can you speak to that? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, that was actually going to be, I was going to um, butt in when I had a chance to, <laughs> to kind of say what yeah, I kind of, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the big change that I think um, I'm anticipating is really um, how we deliver content, like what platforms we use to deliver content, but also how um, uh, our students actually deliver content to um, you know, in, in top forms of submission and assessment. Um, I really think that that's changing. I think that um, new skills are being learned and new platforms are being explored to do that. And that's really exciting. You know, our, our the big one at the moment for our faculty is um, 3D um, submissions. How do you submit a 3D model? So I just I just really see students learning new skills um, in using different platforms to, to do that. Um, mm. and likewise, I think um, there, there's, a shift towards um, being a little bit more um, uh, creative about how you present a 3D object when you don't, you know, the classroom's taken away. Um, I think mm. that that's, whether that's site or whether that's, you know, an I-beam or um, a, an, an artifact or a relic, um, I think that that's, that's really the next, the next thing that I see um, mm. changing. So have you guys, have yeah. you experimented with any of these um, alternatives? We've just set up a digital prototyping lab where we're hoping to maybe do some of these, like particularly using building information models or shared yeah. database um, software environments and that actually walk through. Because I've seen this in practice. I was in practice before I came to education and we were genuinely starting to work a lot more collaboratively in architecture until people realise that you can actually just forget about that collaboration stuff and get a whole bunch of benefit out of shortcutting the process. Um, <laughs> but you can actually engage completely differently in some digital mm -hmm. spaces. Have you tried any of these yet? Yeah, very Ask much so. Um, so we've been, I mean, we've been using various models and mechanisms for presenting described spaces. Um, we have the university has a, a kind of a group that focus on um, digital representations of space that also allows um, people normally, <laughs> normally in campus to move around the campus and connect with digital representations of objects that relate to that place in physical space. So that's thing two. And then thing three is um, a set of tools that our group is exploring just now um, around using 3D constructed virtual space as a site for engagement with either student design ideas or with other students and people. So sharing that um, as avatars or um, other kinds of representations, um, using virtual space as a space for engagement and for learning. Um, so kind of better than Second Life, one would hope, because we, we all saw those discussions 10 years ago, which are interesting, but um, now we've, we've kind of moved on. Um, so there are new, new ways to explore that, I think. So we're, we're excited about some of those things, yeah. So have you, have, do you have any like, feedback from them at all yet? I mean, what do you think are going to be the challenges or the, uh, or the opportunities of these spaces? 
Yeah. I mean, I think... I think the opportunities are probably unfolding before us at the moment. In some ways, some of the real challenges, some of the funny challenges that sit around them right now have to do with um, privacy, data privacy, IP, um, copyright, those kinds of things when students are accessing these tools and are using free versions. So in a way, the risk and I've kind of got my administrator's hat on just now, um, the risk for students who are engaging in learning in these spaces and the risk for institutions um, is for students to find genuine ways to learn and explore, um, but for their work uh, to be within a safe learning context, I guess, um, because these... You know, digital space is not particularly dangerous, but it is important for people to understand its limits and um, uh, and the way that it operates. And so certainly in some of our work, we've found some great places to play and we really enjoy doing that. But we've also found um, that some of the versions of this software that are made available um, don't necessarily protect users, especially people using free downloads um, in the way that those users expect. And uh, so it's it's important for people to be aware of that when they're engaging in these spaces. No, that could, I completely recognise that. That's our massive tension is that, you know, as the open mm. university, we always want to be open. We want as many or as much of our uh, material to be as open source as we possibly can. And then you reach closed mm. environments, usually. I mean, you can, there are open source alternatives to a lot of design software, but yep. yeah, um, I won't, yeah, anyway, so, I mean, how are you going to navigate those tensions or, or are you? Is it just... it's, a, it's a funny thing. I, I think it kind of depends in, in a way it's got to do with how fast this stuff develops. You know, if it travels fast enough, it doesn't matter, you know, because the people who are involved are involved right now. It's happening right now. They're involved. They're making new stuff. That becomes a space of learning. And then that space shifts. And so that learning and that learning experience kind of remains in time, if you like. Um, but uh, if those platforms are, I don't know, heavily commercialised, I guess they move less quickly. And, and at that point, the users, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, but you can see how the users in that kind of a scenario become more exposed to risk. Um, so... <laughs> Isn't that interesting? We've ended up somewhere in data ethics and IP and student integrity, and I don't know how we got there. <laughs> well, I was I was going to say, um, just to kind of bring the conversation back to um, the first notion of uh, our educators as producers, I think it really comes down to yeah. um, thinking about these 3D virtual environments as um, how, how do you curate the experience still? I think that's really, really important, mm. especially in 3D because it's such an open kind of space that you leave um, that you know students have any opportunity to kind of be distracted move around and so I think um, mm -hmm. it's really really key to kind of have a really curated experience in, in those environments. I suppose yeah. in that sense and I, again I don't mean to get in my soapbox I'm so 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 sorry um, <laughs> but in that sense if you do go back into the literature quite literally Kate 10 years ago, mm. you know, live conferences, mm -hmm. for example, all looking at the intersections between virtual and physical spaces and in education as well. A lot of the stuff that you're yeah. talking about now was the same stuff that was talked about back then. It was just in lower mm. resolution and in really bad. I bet people were having similar conversations they about were. the pirates. That's exactly. You know, so my first the tools came. Yeah. It was in fact, my first paper was on digital replication of um, like campuses and how you can't replicate architecture by just making the same shape. Um, yeah. Understanding the translation and conception, like what happens cognitively, that's a far more trickier thing, but that's the thing that you need to actually do. And again, that's the thing I've seen in practice that when people are using digital spaces, yes, they might be looking at the digital representation, but the conceptual model, the idea that's contained in that, that interaction between the two, and that's the thing. I remember a, a fantastic session between a very experienced technician in an architectural office and a very, very new um, practitioner who really knew how to use the software. 
and the experienced architectural technician manipulated him to use the software to demonstrate something that was completely different in those two spaces. Um, so I suppose finding these spaces where the intelligence can emerge, the, the learning mm. stuff can emerge. I suppose that maybe hits on your point, Nancy. Where's that experience that you're trying to get to? Not just let's get past the how do I or the how do I replicate. It's mm. a, what's the new thing or what's the... No, not the new mm. thing. What is the thing that you want to achieve in that space? That mm. could be quite yeah. exciting if we started the, the, the conversation from that point of view. Yeah. Sorry, that sounded... Yeah, beyond... beyond no, 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 it's interesting. It's beyond facility, I guess. And, most definitely. Um, and most designers, yeah. to be quite honest with you. It yeah. goes back to the experience thing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, that's getting a bit, a bit... A bit Heidegger. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, did anybody else want to, <laughs> to join in? There you go. Just um, chuck a thought in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> okay, anybody else want to add anything or make any comments? Fernando, do you want to introduce yourself or say anything? Or Joseph? Oh, great to meet you all. I'm part of Kate's team as well. Um, oh, my background okay. is See, we're all peopled. We've taken <laughs> over. Hi. Cool. <laughs> My background is from engineering, but I've been focusing now um, in online delivery, right. especially on learning technologies. So it's been great to see the change and shift from, uh, you know, I mean, to, to teach presence and now online. Uh, and there are heaps of tools. I can see that even the, the education market is shifting as well, right? To provide solutions uh, as everybody else is really needed uh, different tools now. So as Nancy mentioned, mm -hmm. Of course, 3D is one of those, but there are many other requirements that I think we will see amazing things as the time comes as well. Hmm. No, I think that's, that's absolutely the case. Um, I suppose one of my fears, I don't mean to end on a negative note, but um, I suppose it goes back to the lecture thing. One of the reasons why lectures have been so popular for so long, it is because it's perhaps more teacher focused rather than student focused, um, to be quite blunt and honest about it. And I do worry sometimes some of the colleagues that are maybe not being brought on this journey or who are less keen to engage in that sort of discussion. Um, I think that is a challenge. And you know, I'm not, I, I don't mean that, in a, I don't mean to denigrate their practice or their experience, you know, because it must be absolutely terrifying if everything you know is taken away from you and how you experience mm -hmm. um, sort of learning and education. Yep. That is a terrifying thing. And I've seen some very scared faces. Um, and I remember mm -hmm. my first online lecture, my first online tutorial. My God, that is such a difficult thing, such a difficult first step. Um, yeah. But I, I worry that we might have a legacy of, yeah, other stuff that's maybe not going as well. I wonder how, how do we bring... Mm. Can I, can I just say that yeah, on exactly that point, I had a really actually great experience about a week ago. Um, I typically give a one hour lecture for an engineering subject every year and they'd invited me to participate in the online subject this year. It's typically face to face and I'd gone ahead and recorded my uh, presentation as a number of smaller videos that were very on key and then filmed a small introduction that explained what the learning experience was. And when I sent them through, the, uh, the senior academic, he said, oh, this isn't what I asked for. I've only allocated one hour spot for you in the kind of the lecture capture. I'm gonna knit all of your videos together. And I was initially a bit frustrated by this because I'd gone through and really thought about the student and I encouraged him to actually open my first video that was one minute and 30 seconds to see what my intent had been. And he did that and he then decided that he would actually restructure the way that lecture capture sat for my particular introductory lecture and then went ahead to say that next year when he ran the subject online, he would encourage people to take a similar approach. So for me, it was a little bit of a win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one at a time, Well done, yeah. you. <laughs> one at a time. Is that another analogy to design then? So this goes right back to Kate's point about the richer conversations rather than the how do I, you actually talk about the value or the, the purpose or whatever it is. But in design terms, you know, that is so like every every single client meeting I have ever had in my life. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I know that that's what you think you want, but... 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Is and it's a, a learning and engagement and belonging right in the middle. How are you going to, how do you get to that? How do you get to that? And not, oh, I was reading some great thing about um, sit forward versus sit back media the other day. It was, it was around, I can't remember, um, uh, I should remember who wrote it, but I can't. But it was this kind of idea of media that you kind of sit back and consume versus media that you kind of get involved in and um, encouragement for educators who are using online media to consider how to get people up and out of their seats and um, getting involved in it. And so the idea of a minute and 30 seconds and a kind of a call to action as part of that really is that, that kind of shift. And I think that's a fantastic way of thinking of it. Even I suppose, I mean, there will be some situations where a set back form, like a podcast, for example, maybe a podcast and say secondary material, maybe mm. you listen to while you're doing some other stuff, you know, even just phrasing it in that way to give people the conception, the idea that they're set forward and they're set back is a useful yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Because at least yeah, it's thinking and, about it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, that's not meant to imply that one yeah, is yeah. always appropriate. Yeah. Um, it's more just another kind of theme to put into our design yeah. approach. But the mm. thing is, it's put in a way that's a nice, it's a sticky concept, you know, set back, set forward. It's a metaphor. It's a conceptual gestalt. You know, you can throw that at somebody and they kind of get, oh, right, okay. Yeah, that's what mm. I kind of like about those ones because you can't escape them because they go into your <laughs> kind of mid-tier cognitive processing bit of your brain. But. Mm. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the fact that we're coming to the top of the hour, so... Um, Kate, thank you very much. That was absolutely amazing. It was really, really interesting to hear what you've been doing. Um, and it's really interesting that your team, you and your team, are still energised about it and you're still keen to mm -hmm. do stuff. I think it's going to be interesting. We can maybe catch up again in a few months' time and see what you've been up to. Because <laughs> I yeah, think I love to. interesting and stuff that's coming out. Mm. Oh, look, love to. And, um, I mean, we're, we're all interested and we're all just enjoying making stuff, really. So we're, we're all feeling pretty lucky. I think, yeah. um, but it's, fanta it's fantastic to connect and um, and to hear some more about all of the things that are going on where it's just just after midday. Uh, <laughs> it's all dark where we are, yeah. so but we can we can tell you how the afternoon goes because we've already had it. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, it was quite late. Yeah, I know we need to do this time zone thing better. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. It's wonderful to make contact. Thank you. No, Thank definitely. And I, I, I worry that we're maybe almost missing an opportunity and all these wonderful connections that we're creating. Um, it goes back to that notion of the federation of lectures. It's imagine the types of lectures that we could have if we could. Anyway, anyway we'll oh, talk about that another time. I mean, yeah, no, also, there are some great models. There's some great, one of the one of the fantastic things I would say that's coming out of this experience is the capacity to have these kinds of conversations yeah. and the events that can move so quickly across space. Um, this is a very lucky thing. This yeah. is a very lucky thing. Mm. Definitely, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, um, for your time and for coming along today. I know it's really, really late um, over in Australia, so thank you very much. It really is appreciated, Kate, <laughs> and all the very best. Yeah. Well, thank just you to mention, the next meetup is on the 27th of October, and it's gonna be Robert O'Toole from the UK. And he's going to be presenting some of the different digital tools that they've been using um, to uh, sort of teach design thinking. Um, oh, fascinating. Kind of practical thing. So, yeah, that could be quite an interesting one um, with a particular oh. focus, again, on the student experience and how, how that kind of feedback loop has, has worked for them. So there should be some interesting things right. that of, um, Robert. Oh, from. well, thank you, Robert. We can see you in the chat. We'll look forward to hearing some more. It's probably like teaching a class as he's oh, there he listening is. to this. There he is. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I, I've been listening all along. It's absolutely fascinating work from Melbourne then. So I yeah. think a lot of what oh, we're doing fits in with that quite nicely. I think we're probably quite similar universities as well. So if we don't yeah. have a design school, so that's the interesting <gasps> difference. So that's yeah. what we'll find out in the next session is how do you teach design yeah. when you don't have a design school? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Madness. No architecture. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thanks for that. That'd be really good. Thank okay. you. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. And um, I'll stop the recording there and I'll catch you all next time. Thank you very much.